equal stages of script number four. Zindika's playwriting and beyond. Zindika talks to Aisha Casely Hayford about her play Paper and Stone. Zindika, it's such, such a pleasure to be able to talk to you directly about Paper and Stone. What an exceptional opportunity. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So, as a nation in the late 1980s and into the 90s, so you wrote the play in in the late 1980s, is that right? Yes, I wrote it... um... A lot earlier than it was produced. Um, I wrote it in towards the end of the 80s. Yeah, that's when I wrote the play. Um, So what gave you the inspiration for it, thinking about where we were as a country and then the themes that are in the play? Well, play. The play um, is quite complex and it it really travels quite a distance within the play. So there, there were lots of ideas that I had. But at the time, I guess, in the 80s when I was writing this, this was sort of coming out from the 70s into the 80s, and there were lots of people in, um, you could say, within British society, particularly in the main cities, you know, London, not just the main city of London, but also Birmingham and all the other sort of, you know, Bristol, all those areas. There was a lot of um, discontentment. And there was particularly a lot of discontentment amongst the young uh, black people, um, and a majority of whom were from Caribbean descent, you know, at that time. And so that was some of the backdrop, I think, to the things that were happening during the 80s. A lot of discontentment, upheavals going on in terms of, you know, young people speaking out. And the way they were speaking out was in terms of, you know, like, you know, we had all the the history of the rights and things like that were happened across all of the main cities. You know, it would start in one city and before you know it, the next weekend it would be in another city. So there was obviously something that was really, really upsetting the youths and some way in which they weren't being heard. And I would say that was a backdrop to a lot of the things that I wrote at that time because prior to writing um, Paper and Stone, I'd written two other plays. One play was never seen by anyone. And the second play I wrote, um, that was... Again, not produced, but it was seen by a few people who who, who I had then had the the, the, um, the confidence that by this point to say, oh, let me show it to somebody else. You know, I was quite, sort of quite brave. Let me just sort of tiptoe in and sort of allow somebody else to look at it. And yeah, and I showed it to a few people, and the feedback um, on that second piece was was actually um, really encouraging as well. And that that second one was also again looking again at the discontentment amongst um, young black people at that time, because that was based on the experience of a young Young, young lad who was going through school and some of his experiences of how he was experiencing school, really. So from there on, uh, I then went into um, looking at Paper and Stone. And I realised as well, I need to write from my own experience, you know, rather than sort of focusing on what maybe what a young boy might be thinking, because I wasn't a young boy. So I thought, oh, I need to focus on myself as a woman, you know, as a girl. What, what am I doing? This is, this is my experience. And that was also some of the feedback I got as well, you know. And I realised as well then when I started to approach Paper and Stone was that when I started to dive into it was that, wow, there's a lot that I felt as a young woman at that time that I wanted to explore. And not just only what I felt, but also what I could see like um, other people around me feel, other young people. And also the older generation who never really ever had a voice, you know. And so that was why, you know, I wanted to explore this at that time. At that time in the, in the 80s, it really was just really a lot of, lot of divide, you know, in society at, at that time. And um, the thing is as well about that time was the divide, to me, it was, it was like a three-part divide. It was because it wasn't just the divide between youth and society. It's obvious that youth was alienated, you know, but there was also the alienation between them and parents who were coming from the Caribbean, from one place, you know, migrant, the whole migrant migration issues. And also it was about a divide between them and the indigenous population as well. You know, um, the indigenous population, it was like they probably felt that, you know, who are these people? Are they taking us over? That sort of thing was going on. Do you know what I mean? And you could probably even see aspects of it in, in the school classroom as well. You know, so, so, that, so there was so much, so much going on that really, you know, when I started to write, you know, all of that, you know, come, was coming out in, in what I was writing. And one, one of the things I always have a problem with when I write, you know, whatever I write, you know, I always have so much that I want to say. 
<laughs> so you could probably see a lot of it in the play that I touch on so many things. But the way I deal with it is I try to interweave it. And that's just the way I write. You know, I try to interweave it. And I enjoy it, actually. I enjoy that, that aspect of writing, just weaving things together and then seeing how they all connect. And usually they connect somewhere. Yeah, I really, it's true, that is very much your style, and I could pick that out in the play, like how much was in there, and there was just so much for us all to have an opportunity to connect with, and then we felt, when we were looking at the play to perform it, gosh, just that topic is a play in itself, that topic is a play in itself, so I, that's completely accurate, and definitely with Paper and Stone, I had the feeling that it was so much of its time, I was like, wow, this is like really what was happening there. I could feel the power of it. Just what you were saying towards the end there was a perfect segue to the next question I wanted to talk to you about, which is this generational investigation that takes place in the play, in particular with Martha's character. So that's Brenda's mother. Hmm. And it would be lovely to discuss that in more detail with you because I do find that very unique. It sort of gets... I'm not really seeing that often explored, maybe because it is such a women's thing, that mother, daughter, you know, mother, you know, women through the generations. So to obviously, whatever you want to share, I'd love to know, but I am interested particularly what it means to you having Martha's character there and what you wanted to explore with Martha's character and also her abstract character of C. And then just, just interested as to why you didn't include that character of C in the title. So there's Paper and Stone, which is Juliet and Brenda, but it's not Paper, Stone and C. It's just mm. curious. <laughs> yes. Well the, well, the Paper and the Stone actually comes from the, the game, you know, Paper and Stone and Scissors, Cut Paper and Wrap Stone. So I think it was just more a case of how it sounds really, you know, the fact that it's, it's the duality of the, 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 the characters as well, because the, the main duality that I was exploring was um, was a, a duality between the two characters um, and, and creating the contrast between one that was um, Brenda, who was brought up in a very um, loving home and sort of protected, 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 um, whereas J Juliet was like the outsider and she hadn't been brought up in the same way, so she'd she, she was kind of like the lost child, you know, who never had the same... Um, and she was kind of more exposed to the elements of society and didn't have anybody to protect her in the same way. Uh, and then here she comes into the world of, 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 of Brenda. So immediately that there was a contrast there that I wanted to explore, you know. And that was um, obviously um, represented by the paper and the stone and the fact that one character is soft and the other character is obviously a much harder and harsher character and the impact that both of those elements can have on each other. But the other dualities, of course, is between um, Brenda and uh, Martha's character. So Martha is, of course, the, like, the, 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 the woman who represents, it's almost like she's the, the Earth Mother, she represents so much. And um, it was an exploration of that. It was an exploration of the struggles that black women actually go through and also what they actually endure in order to actually um, really bring up their children and in particular when they're bringing up in, in, a, in, a, in a different place, you know, in a, in a, in a society that, that they're not familiar with and, you know, they're trying to sort of put across um, all the different ways in, you know, put across things like their culture and, and things like, you know, Martha's becomes, it's very religious and that's part of the protection as well, the religion, and it's part of what she relies on, it's what's helped her through to be strong. But within that strength, there's a lot of softness behind the strength because there's a lot of things, there are a lot of things that are hidden behind the strength that, that people wouldn't normally see. And even when Brenda tries to pry or prod into that to find out that softness, it's, it's, she, 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 she finds that very hard. You know, so, so it's some things that, you know, Martha cannot display. So my role then as the, the writer was to try and display some of that. And I think it's something whereby um, as black women, particularly, I think it's not even just that older generation, but all generations coming up, you know, 
my generation or even some of the younger generations than myself, it's something that they, they have, a, have a, um, this face which is stoic all the time. And it's, it's, but behind that, it's like, you know, we know there's a lot behind it. And I've seen it not just in my own mother and in my own relationship with my mother, but also in my aunties as well. It's the same sort of thing. So, so there was that coming through. There was elements of my own mother, my aunties coming through in it. Um, and of course, just knowing about society in general and, and about knowing about some of the struggles that black women have endured, um, just so that they can exist really and that they, they can live the life that they have to and do what they can do for, you know, for their own, for their children um, and their community. They do a lot for their community as well. So, so yeah, that, that's what was coming through. And, um, but I didn't want, I remember when I first met um, the director, Pam Fraser Solomon, she, one of the first things she said to me was, um, do you see this as a kitchen sink drama? And I said, no, <laughs> I said, no, no, no. And she says, OK, that's all I need to know. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's great. I said, no, no, it's definitely not a kitchen sink drama. And um, when, I was, when I was coming up with the play and some of the symbols that you, you are in it, I actually, I, I didn't see anything like, like a home as such, you know. Uh, I didn't see a living room or a kitchen or anything like that, really. Um, and um, I, think, I think when I thought about how it's going to look on the stage, I sort of had an image that maybe there was a, a door to represent a home or something like that. But that, that the rest of it, the paper and the stone, would also... Um, but, but there would be a clear distinction between the, when, when they were in that element of the paper on the stone or when they were in the element of sitting at home chatting to, to, to mother or, you know... So uh, that, that was the only thing that that would be clear when they, they went from one, to, from, from the natural to the, to the real, the, the, you know, the not so re natural, you know, part of it. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so in terms of what you, you're saying about um, the character of, of Martha and the sea, yeah, I just, I, it, it, yeah, I think it, I, would, I just wanted to explore really that whole idea of the, the contrast between um, the two main protagonists, Brenda and, and, and June. Juliet, really, um, and for Martha coming in, really, as like, to me, her sea was like the calmness, and she was like bringing something that was going to wash over everything, you know, and she was bringing in wisdom, you know, and she was bringing in culture, and she was bringing in something that was going to wash over all of that, um, all of that, maybe even that hardness that Brent, that um, Juliet brought with her, you know, and that, that's kind of what was happening as well in the play, that um, Juliet was beginning to mellow a bit when she, she, she came in contact with Martha, you know. So, 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 yeah, so there was lots of things happening there. Absolutely, all of that, and this idea of the mothers and the aunts, like you said, and that stoic outside, it potentially leads to so much misunderstanding. So it's so nice what you've done there to give us an opportunity to really see that and the pain and the resilience and the power that presents this, you know, front that could so easily be misunderstood or, you know, I'll say hid, hiding behind religion, but I don't mean that. I just mean sort of this structure that's there that is, you know, the real mm. person, the real woman that's behind that, you've really, yeah. And as I said, mm. I just don't think I've ever seen that before in actual fact, because it's very subtle and it's yeah. cultural, it's very specific. Um, so yeah, mm. it's just, just wonderful. Mm. I think the other thing I was trying to, to do there as well was at the time, there was a lot of, um, mm, it was a deep rift between the uh, young black people and society. But, there was also elements of it within the family because um, there was an extent to which particularly a lot of young, 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 young people, young men and women were saying they, and, and it's also something that's repeated with all migrant generations and it doesn't even matter what culture. Um, it's just something about when you shift lands and you, you shift perspectives and you, you, you've got one culture and you're trying to integrate into another. It's just something that goes with it. And uh, 
things that were said at the time, and it was always often being said, particularly when the upheavals was was on the t was out and about, and people were writing about it and talking about it and asking young people, "What's the problem? Why why are you so angry?" You know, and some of the things that were coming out would be things like, "Oh, you know, the the generation that's come here and brought us here don't really understand us. They don't really understand the society from our perspective," which is true because the generation that brought us here actually came with different needs, you know, and uh, their outlook um, was different to say the ones who were born here or brought up here. It was different because they were dis experiencing the society in a different way than the older generation. And so they would always go back to that and say, oh, well, that's what's also creating some of the rift that is this really, you know, they're just not understanding what we experience, you know, particularly if you're going through the school system or you're going out into the world of work or you're just walking about the street and the way people see you. You as an older generation person, you don't see that. You don't experience that. Um, and that is so true. Um, and even if you bring it up to date, well, not even even as up to the, 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 the noughties, you know, but I remember I did, um, how, how we don't see things really, um, it, it, we can't really, put, trying to put ourselves in somebody else's shoe, I guess, um, that when I did, um, I did a little research, I can't remember when this was, this might in the 90s, yeah, it was just, yeah, that's right, it was at the turn of the, the 2000s, it was something to do with um, the millennium, so I did a research around, um, young black people's experience, you know, coming up to the millennium. And one of the things that um, came out at the time from a lot of the young children going through school was um, they would talk about walking about the street. And I would say, as an older person, I'd be like, I, I could not see what they were seeing. But when they would tell me things, I'd say, oh, you experienced that. And they, I would be walking along the same high street that they walk along, but they were having a different experience to myself as an older person, that they would tell me things. I said, wow, that happened on that high street and I walk there all the time and I never noticed anything strange going on. I, would, I didn't see it as a, as, a, as a place that was violent or anywhere, you know what I mean? Because I'm having a different experience. And the same can be said as well of people who are from different race. So say, for example, white people might see it, say the same thing to black people. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, of course, because you walk along the same street as me, but you're not seeing the same things, you know, because, you, yeah. So that, that was also something that I kind of wanted to, to show through Brenda and Martha's character as well, that Martha didn't necessarily understand what Brenda uh, might be experiencing uh, as, as well, you know? Absolutely. I'd even say as well with Brenda and Juliet, like you rightly said, because of mm. their upbringings, they have very different... Uh, they've, had, they've already had different experiences just already, which causes their argument, you know? They have a misunderstanding of expectations, you know, yeah. and how you cope and deal with things. Um, in, sorry, I also wanted to just try and back what you said about the stage and the setup. Mm -hmm. It's so mm -hmm. funny. I had exactly the same sort of idea. I think where it feels very um, mystical to me, very ethereal, because like, that wonderful way you've got these styl stylized and naturalistic scenes. So straight away, I was like, right, this is different and it took me somewhere you know very out of the um domestic situation because of that so yeah yeah i, I definitely got that from from reading the manuscript um mm. so in in the play there's a reference to a Ghanaian lullaby mm. being from ghana myself i was like oh oh that's cool <laughs> so um i mean did you have a specific lullaby in mind? And what was the idea behind the inclusion of that in the play? I mean, you do reference music, especially yeah. in that last stylized scene, and there's lots of references to music and singers. So what was what was that about? Yeah, no, well, that came out of the working with all the other creative artists in the piece, you know, the, the, the choreographer, um, musician, and the set designer, all of those people and directors. It's one, that's one, one of the great things about being a playwright when you sort of get to sort of, you know, bring your skills together with all these other people. It's wonderful. And just to see the magic, as you said, it's magical when you see all of this come together. You think, wow, you know? So um, 
yeah, I did have reference to a Ghanaian um, lullaby, but no, I didn't have an idea of what that would be. You know, I didn't sort of have written any, I didn't write any songs or anything like that. But for me, the connection was that connection, you know, obviously, like I said, be, being, it's like a, that three-part connection, you know, Caribbean, um, UK and Africa, you know, it's just that three-part connection. So when I write, I'm, I'm also writing with my heart, you know, my heart's in Africa, you know, and um, all of that um, came up when I was writing the piece particularly when I was thinking about alienation and, you know, when you think about alienation and you feel like you're, you're in a country where you may be feeling alienated, your heart goes out to other places. Um, and for a lot of us young people at the time, it went out to Africa, you know, and Africa wasn't just in our minds, it was also in our songs as well, you know, from the time the Caribbean, all the reggae, you know, it was always about Africa, so that was there, you know. And even in my own upbringing, you know, I would hear my, my dad in particular always used to talk about Africa. So that was there in me, you know. So whenever I, I think about us as a nation, whether we're from um, the Caribbean, well, the, us, us as migrants you know, in the UK, coming from the Caribbean, I always also relate that to Africa. And as I was writing the piece, um, there's this close connection because Jamaica has a close connection with Ghana in terms of um, the way in which the whole um, transatlantic slavery also went. So there's that close connection and um, in terms of the origins of people. So you hark to those things in your imagination and you, you know, you're looking for connection. And some of those are some of the connections that were coming out for me. Um, the whole African connection um, was part of, of, of people feeling a sense of wanting to belong. And when you feel like you don't belong, which a lot of young people at the time would have felt they didn't really belong. And then they'd think, do I really belong in the Caribbean? And they might think, no, I don't really. So they look for somewhere else. Where do I really belong? And of course, it's always Africa, the motherland, you know, that's where we really and truly belong, you know? And no one could say we don't belong there, you know? So yeah, so that's, that's what I, I, I always um, bring in. And I think, you know, in all my pieces that I write, you know, that's always there because it, it's, 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 also, it's just part of my creative process. And I don't think it would ever stop. That's just part of my creative process. That immediately I start to write, whether it's a play or anything else, you know, that, um, that connection to, to, to the motherland of Africa um, always, always comes out. It comes out as well in the, because I write, um, I know my, my writing is like in a very poetic way again, because that's just how it comes out as well. I can't say why, but it's just how it comes out in a poetic way. And I, I just go with that flow, really, you know, because that, that's just my style, as, as, as I say, you know, it's just the way I write. No, it's so, so, so wonderful. And it makes it beautifully accessible. Like when I saw that reference to a Guinean lullaby, I felt at home because of that call to the ancestors and then having it within the play, linking it to that root, um, put it like I, I think of it with Martha's character as C, like it made it. Um, bigger than itself in a way so you always had sort of a home to go back to so very intense and traumatic things are discussed but then there's like a home to go back to because we've begun with this lullaby you know and obviously like it being a lullaby so I think that was lovely that that came out of workshop as well because it obviously means that was there in the room coming mm. out creatively um, I think that was just a fantastic addition in there and even the fact it's not described was quite interesting because it meant I had to go and search mm. and then, you know whoever then puts on the play at each time they could look couldn't they and maybe find different find something yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it becomes a, you know a wealth of um, knowledge being brought together we'll now we'll collect Guinean lullabies every time yeah. <laughs> we perform paper and so, yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah. are there right. any aspects I mean we're what um, you know 20 years on Mm. Um, are there any aspects you might want to change or develop further, if, if it's okay to ask that kind of question? Uh, one, one of the things I... I um, well, even if you're talking about generations and migration, and, you know, Britain itself is, is, a, is, a, is a country of migrants, as we all know. <laughs> you know, people like pretend they're not, <laughs> but they are. 
And so, they, you know, there's always going to be migration. And to me, that's life. You know, I don't have any issue in any form of migration. I think that's life. That's people. People move around. If people did move around, we wouldn't all be where we are anyway, you know, wherever we are all over the world. That's how, because we moved. <laughs> so, you know, so I think it's great. It just enriches, you know, enriches everything. Um, wherever you are, it just brings in more richness. So you say that in the last 20 years or so, there's been there's a new African um, community. Um, and I go into schools all the time. Well, I haven't been in there recently, but it's been last, probably like two years, well, last two years, I certainly haven't been in there much, <laughs> but um, maybe prior to that, <laughs> yeah. And so... Yes, I know. So most of the young black children now in the schools, a lot of them are from Nigerian Ghanaian background. So I know that even though we as Caribbeans have been through a certain experience and what, what, what part of that experience has been recorded, positive or negative, you know, cultural or creative, whatever, that whether it's there for uh, new generations of young people. And that's important. And when I see some of those young people, I think I see them experiencing the similar thing. And they are also experiencing the old idea of belonging as well, that we all went through. And sometimes I think, oh, surely they shouldn't really be as, as, as be really experiencing that really as much, um, especially after what we've been through. You know, there should be something there already for them to be able to sort of look to and say, oh, you know, you know, just like I looked to other people before me, you know, said, oh, yeah, they did that then and, you know, whatever. But I do think there is that element going on as well with those young people are struggling as well with the whole idea of belonging and also coming from a different culture, parents from a different culture to you and you trying to belong or sort of um, settle into your new community, but feeling that sense of alienation and, and how it comes across. Of course, it's not the same community, of course, because, you know, obviously coming from Nigeria or Ghana, your culture is different and they're going to have different things in their background. But still, there's that idea of just being migrants in this country and what that brings with it. And that we really have to be wary about the children and what they go through because they're really stuck in the middle, really. All the time they're stuck in the middle because they are really, really trying to belong in the same way that the parents are not trying to belong in the same way, you know. And so we have to be wary of that and how that impacts on them. And so, I mean, I can see aspects of the play, how that could be changed in terms of even bringing in some more of those cultural references, you know, into, into the play, you know, in terms of if it was a, a modern version of the play, how those kind of cultural references could come in. Um, and I'm already seeing aspects of it, not necessarily in playwright, but in other, in other ways, you know, where, where people from Nigeria and Ghana are exploring, young people born and brought up here are exploring their themes. So all of that, I can see, it's just, again, creating more a lovely, lovely, rich um, expression, you know? Mm -hmm. So I could see ways in which I could change the play in that way. But one of the main things that, that happened to me that I would say is the importance of the play going forward and in terms of what you, 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 you were all doing as well, in terms of, of bringing me in on this, in terms of doing this digital production, which is wonderful, you know, and I really welcome it. Um, thank you for remembering me <laughs> and bringing me in. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> but what happened to be like, how many years ago? I can't remember, but it's certainly within the last 10 years. I was actually out somewhere. Um, I was doing something around my book, talking about it selling my books, you know. I was at, at some, a young lady came up to me and she came running up to me, you know, and she said, oh, Zindika, Zindika. And I was like, oh, hello. And, you know, so we had a little exchange. And she goes, oh, gosh, you know, I, I know your play and your book, you know, you're in this book and your play. And I was like, oh, wonderful. I go, oh, okay, that's nice, you know. And then she sort of um, stopped and she goes, do you know something, Zindika? I'm actually a theatre student. And I goes, oh, that's great. And she goes, and I've got your books, you know, my... my not, not Paper and Stone, but I think Leonore starts my other play after Paper and Stone. It's actually published in a book of black and Asian women. Yes. And um, she says, I've got that book. She goes, Indica, and yeah, and I've read your play and blah, 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 blah. You know, she would chat. And then she said, you know something, I'm a theatre student and I was in my lecture one day. And at the end of the lecture, the lecture was talking about playwriting and all the wonderful playwrights, etc., etc., etc. And at the end of it, I went up to him and I asked him, I said, are there any black female playwrights? She didn't mention any. <laughs> and and, uh, and she said, 
she looked at, he looked at her, sort of looked down at her like, ooh, you know, and said, no, there's no such thing. And that, those, were her exact, they, those were her exact words to me. And she said those were his exact words. No, there are no such thing. So I, I always remember that one. And, and she said, she, said um, she was shocked when he said that because obviously he's a lecturer and he's talking about playwrights in the UK and etc. And she's a, a black student on a, on, a, on a course like that. And she said she knew she had this book at home. <laughs> so, she, so the next day she went, she went home, she searched for the book, found it, and she brought it into him the next day and said... You said there were no such thing as black female playwrights. Here are six of them in this book. <laughs> Great person. And she, <laughs> Do we know what he said in response? I know. I think she said he just looked very embarrassed and was like, she didn't know what to do. I don't know what happened after that. But. Wow. I'm glad we've got that on record. <laughs> it's actually a thing. But, wow. Yeah. But, but that's something that, that I think about often when I write. I think, wow, you know, it's this idea of being written out of history. Mm. And that's why I write, you know, one of my main reasons for writing and continuing to write, because, you know, we have um, contributed so much and that contribution should not go on being lost, really. And it's really down to us to make sure that it's not lost. And, you said it um, so perfectly. Yeah. You, you said know. it so perfectly. And it's Martha's lines, isn't it? Mm. What's, what's the black woman to do with her invisible life? Mm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Thank you so yeah. much. I've yeah. literally got so much to now reflect on further on this conversation. Like, mm. I feel very I, charged. Um, I, I do. Yeah. Like, it's, um, it's a lot. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate okay, it. You're most welcome. And thank you. Thank you for, for, for doing this, actually. Um, when I heard about that, you were doing a digital version. I thought, wow, interesting, you know, because obviously I know the world is very, digi very digital now. So, so that sort of move is, is great, really. And I do welcome it. And, and thank you for including me in it. So. May it spread far and wide. Yeah, yeah. OK, bye for now. Thank you. That was Zindika's Playwriting and Beyond with Zindika and Aisha Casely-Hayford. <laughs>